So let's get started. Uh, today the goal for discussion is to understand how dynamic programming is applied on simple problems. Uh, for complicated problems including dynamic programming, uh, you need to write uh, quite a complicated code on, uh, on in Python or C++ or whatever is your favorite programming language, MATLAB. Uh, but for simple ones, you can actually compute things by hand. So I just wanted to show you how dynamic programming is actually implemented. Uh, like how do you compute dynamic programming? Like how do you compute value functions and policy uh, by hand in a dynamic programming setting? So the first problem I want to talk about today is the linear quadratic regulator problem. So my problem is that I have a linear system and my cost function is quadratic. I want to minimize over all gamma t that maps xt to ut. Remember that my observation here yt is equals to xt. So I'm observing the entire state without any noise. Uh, one, when, when we had discussed, when we had talked about the system model, we were quite a bit general. We were talking about observation noise, system noise, actuation noise, and so on. Right now, there is no actuation noise, and the observation is equal to the complete state itself. I want to minimize over all gamma t uh, summation of, I have a reference state x bar t. It is the reference state and my uh, problem is to track the reference state as closely as possible while applying the minimum control effort to do so, to do the tracking. So this is, Q is positive, def, positive semi-definite, R is positive definite. This is my tracking error. And this T goes from one to capital T. <coughs> this is my control effort. And then I have a terminal cost. It is the terminal cost. Okay, that's the overall setting that we are trying to uh, solve. I want to find the optimal policy at all time steps. Once you write it down, then I'll explain what this problem is attempting to do. Okay, so here is what this is doing. I want my xt, which is my state, to be as close to the reference state. 
So the reference temperature for this room is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I want the temperature in the room to be as close to the 72 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, which is the reference state here. Uh, so what I will do is I will add a quadratic cost to it. Just because quadratic has a nice functional form, it's always positive. Remember Q is a positive semi-definite matrix. So this cost is always going to be uh, uh, non-negative. And then I want to make sure that I'm not doing too much cooling and too much heating of the room in order to achieve that objective. So that's why I have this control cost, control effort. So if I do too much cooling and too much heating, I spend a lot of energy uh, in cooling and heating the room. Uh, so I don't want to put in too much control effort. Uh, so I'm adding that particular cost here. And then there is a terminal cost. The terminal cost, of course, in the case of this particular room, there is no terminal cost. It's not like the room is going to evaporate at some point of time. Uh, but in some cases, for instance, if you're going to the Mars, you want to be as close to the terminal location on the planet Mars or on the moon, wherever you are going, you want to be as close to that point as possible. So you might have a small tracking error, but you might have a very large terminal cost error, terminal cost by, by picking very large value of this positive semi-definite matrix uh, QT plus one, uh, because you might, be, you might want to be as close to X bar T as possible. So when you want to, when you leave your house, and you want to get to the university for a specific class, you want to be as close to the class as possible. By the time you reach the university, you can't just go anywhere. And so you have a very high terminal cost. So you might change your path in between, like you might have decided that I want to take this path to get to the university or to get to the classroom. But when you get there, you might want to change your path for whatever reason, maybe there's a lot of traffic on the road or whatever. So you might want to have lower tracking error in those cases so that it allows you to change your path um, uh, at the expense of uh, small control effort, but you still want your terminal cost to be very high because you really want to get to the reference terminal state, X bar T plus one. So in those cases, you have a terminal cost as well. So this particular model actually encompasses a wide variety of uh, tracking problem where you might want to have a, where you might have a terminal cost because you want to get to a specific state uh, with high precision, but you also have tracking error and you have control effort. And what this control policy, optimization based control policy is able to do is to do, to do the optimal trade off between all these three sources of uh, uh, cost. So it does trade off between the terminal cost, the tracking error and the control effort added over the entire time step, okay? So it does the entire trade-off based on the matrix Q and R and the QT plus one, okay? So these are the matrices that you need to figure out based on the parameters that matter to you and based on the things that matter to you and things that don't matter to you. So if the control effort is very small, like control effort is not too costly, you can keep your R matrix to be small if your tracking error is not important, you can keep your Q matrix to be small, or you can even eliminate Q matrix completely, because Q uh, is just a positive semi-definite matrix, so it can be a zero matrix as well. Okay, does that uh, make sense? Now the question is, this is a dynamic optimization problem. We need to optimize over the policies. Uh, at all time steps, so let's try to solve it using dynamic programming. So this is my terminal cost. So remember, the first thing we need to do is V capital T XT, which is equal to, I'm going to minimize with respect to UT of not summation, just the terminal, terminal cost. So xt minus x bar t transpose q xt minus x bar t ut transpose r ut plus a xt plus b ut minus x bar t plus one transpose QT plus one. So 
So I want to do the following. I want to collect all the UT terms together because I'm minimizing with respect to UT. So I want to collect all the UT terms together. And uh, the XT terms can be collected separately. So let's try to do that. I need to put a minimum here. Any questions so far? All I have done is collected all the terms together. So I collected all the UT transpose matrix UT term in one place. Then UT transpose BT transpose the cross term with XT is the second term. And this is the term that only involves XT and X bar T plus one. It doesn't involve UT at all. But remember, we are minimizing with respect to UT. So, this term actually doesn't participate in the optimization at all because it really doesn't depend on UT. So I can completely ignore this term because this term is just, uh, it, it's not that important. Uh, for the minimization, it's not important. It will be important in the value function, okay? So we'll talk about it in a few minutes. But for now, I want to find what U star T is. So what do you think we should do for computing U star T? We had done this in like three or four classes ago. So let's try to do a simple problem and then we can get back to this problem. So, so look at what the structure of this particular optimization problem is. I have a UT transpose. What kind of matrix is this? So this is a positive definite matrix. Remember by assumption. 
This is a positive semi-definite matrix and I'm multiplying by B transpose and multiplying it by B on this side. So this matrix is actually a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, because this matrix is a positive semi-definite matrix and you pre-multiply it and multiply it by the same matrix. Now you add a positive definite matrix with a positive semi-definite matrix, what you get is a positive definite matrix. So this is, this matrix is actually positive definite. Then I have a tr term which is UT transpose and if you look at this particular term, it's just a scalar. So you have a matrix times a, uh, a square matrix times a vector. So this particular term is just a vector. And then you have something which doesn't depend on UT at all. So from the point of view of minimization problem, this is just a constant because it doesn't depend on UT, right? It only depends on XT. And remember X bar T is something that's given to us. So we can't really change X bar T at all. Okay, so let's try to minimize uh, U transpose, let me say R U, R bar U plus U transpose B. And I want to minimize with respect to U in R M. Yeah. So X is in R N, U is in R M. How do I solve this particular problem? Remember it's a, this R bar is a positive definite matrix. And what, what, if you look at the second derivative of this function, the second derivative is actually R bar itself. So let me call this F of U or C of U. So gradient of C of U what is this equal to? 2R bar U plus, uh, let me put a 2 here as well, because there is a 2 here in this expression. So 2R bar U plus 2B. So this implies that C is convex. Okay, so I want to solve this minimization problem where this particular matrix is positive definite. I take the first derivative of the cost function. I take the second derivative of the cost function. I conclude that the second derivative is a positive definite matrix. Consequently, this function C is convex. So if you go back three or four classes ago, when we were talking about optimization and when we were talking about convex function, one of the things we learned is that if second derivative of a function is a positive definite matrix, then that function is a convex function. And the another fact that we learned is for convex function, the optimal solution must satisfy gradient of C of U star equal to zero. So if the function F is convex, and I find a U star such that the gradient of C at U star is equal to zero, then u star is the optimal solution. u star minimizes this expression. So let's check when is gradient of c of u star equals to zero. So this implies that two r bar u star plus two b equals to zero. Can someone tell me what u star would be equal to?
what is the value of u star here? Yes. Is it minus um, yes. minus r bar inverse prime b? That's right. This is minus r bar inverse b. That's my u star. Okay. Now what is C of U star? I think we need to calculate that as well. So I need to plug in this value of U star right here in the expression. So let's try to do that here. So R bar inverse B transpose r bar, <coughs> r bar inverse p. So the negative terms cancel each other out. Let me put the negative term anyways. Plus two u trans, no, plus two minus r bar inverse b, b transpose. Right, I think that's what we should get. What is the first term equal to? What is this term equal to? That's this matrix, mul uh, matrix multiplication. So I have R bar inverse B transpose R bar and then again R bar inverse B and then I have two negative R bar inverse B transpose B. Okay, just plugging in the value of U star here in this expression. What do I get? Someone can, can someone do this? <coughs> Figure out what this expression looks like. You want to give it a shot? Uh, B transpose R bar inverse B minus two B transpose R bar inverse B. So remember when you are taking a transpose of this matrix, then this becomes B R bar inverse transpose, right? But remember that R bar is a positive definite matrix, so it's a symmetric matrix. So symmetric matrix transpose is a symmetric matrix, so it's a matrix itself and then you are taking the inverse of that, so it becomes R bar inverse. So that R bar inverse multiplies by this R bar, which multiplies with this R bar inverse, so all we are left with is R bar inverse. So we have this term, which is minus B transpose R bar inverse B. Not quite B square, but, uh, but there is this term, uh, R bar inverse in the middle. So I'm going to write it here, uh, that U star is equal to minus R bar inverse uh, B <coughs> and grade C of U star equals to minus B transpose R bar inverse B.
Okay, so I, I noted down this expression and then I noted down this expression. Those two expressions are right here. So I've noted it down because now I have to minimize it and then I have to find the value as well. Any questions on this side of the board? I have to erase this side. So I'll take a question or two right now on this side. All we've done is we have a convex function here. I wanted to find out what the optimal solution is and what the optimal value is. So optimal solution is this, optimal value is this, okay? Okay, so now I need to in implement this, like I need to figure out what the expression for this statement is here. Now we know what the solution is like for a simpler problem. All we need to do is substitute, so this is my R bar, <coughs> and this is my B, small b, right? This is my R bar, and this is my small b. So now I'll, uh, and remember that this is my gamma star, the, the argument at which this function is minimized, that's my gamma star, and the value is the expression the value itself. So my gamma star T, capital T, of X capital T, which is the optimal policy, what is it equal to? <coughs> Minus R plus V transpose QT plus 1B inverse, and then this expression AXT minus X bar T plus What does computing the, so, rem, so remember we were talking about how difficult it is to solve the dynamic programming problem because you have to do a lot of uh, sampling in the state space and then you have to solve one optimization problem per sample and so on. In this particular case, we don't have to do any of that. Everything can be done by hand. In fact, the cool thing here is that look at each of these operations. So matrix addition, matrix multiplication, matrix inversion, matrix multiplication, uh, just some vector computation. So all of the terms, individual terms, are extremely easy and cheap. You can run it on a microcontroller. The only difficult part is the matrix inversion. So matrix inversion is a somewhat complicated process if you have to write a code for it. But as far as the multiplication part is concerned, of course MATLAB does the inversion and all that very easily, and so does Python. But if you have to write a code in microcontroller, I think all of this is going to be easy. The only thing difficult would be to do this matrix inversion. So imagine when the Apollo mission went to the moon or when missions go to the Mars or mission go to various other places, they're all fully autonomous missions. Uh, there's very little interference from the ground station, specifically because the delays, the amount of time it takes for the signal to reach these remote uh, satellites and remote uh, rovers is very, very long. If I'm not mistaken, it takes about 14 minutes for information to go from Earth to Mars. So you can't reliably control systems that are so far out. So it, they have to be run autonomously, uh, but 
if you are responsible for the Mars rover uh, mission or for any of these satellite missions, uh, you need to be able to compute the optimal policy on the microcontrollers on the vehicle itself, on the rover, on the satellite, on the rockets itself. And the computation is fairly straightforward. But you do have to know how to do the matrix inversion in a microcontroller. It's, that part may not be obvious. That gives you the policy, the optimal policy, which is U star. Okay, so we get the U, UT star. And remember, this is a function of xt, okay? So this is given, this is a constant, this is the reference state that's given to us. It's a function of just the state itself, okay? So that's why I've written it as a function of the state. Now I need to find out what vt of xt is. And remember, the value function is the value of this whole expression at ut star. So I need to plug in the value of u, u t star here in this expression. And then the top part is actually equal to this and the bottom part will remain as it is. So let's look at the top part, what that leads us to. So that is minus a x t minus x bar t plus one transpose. Qt plus one, B, so minus B transpose R inverse, R bar inverse, so that is R plus B transpose Qt plus one B inverse. And then I have to write B again. So that is equal to B transpose QT plus one, this term here. Did I make any mistake here? Not really. Yeah, everything looks perfect. So this is the first term, and then I need to put the second term, so that is xt minus x bar t transpose q x minus x bar t plus a x t minus x bar t plus one transpose qt plus one. This term is going to come here. Any question? I got this part, the top part from here, B transpose R bar inverse B with a negative sign. So I have the negative sign right here. I have B transpose R bar inverse B. And then I have this term which didn't participate in the optimization because it doesn't depend on you. So I added the term right here, plus. Now guess what? Uh, can we collect some terms together? I think there is a term of AXT minus X bar T plus one transpose a matrix times this. That term looks right here. And then there is this another term XT minus X bar T transpose Q. This term is right here. So I can collect both of these terms. And what I get is, Vt of xt is xt minus x bar t transpose q xt minus x bar t 
plus Ax t minus x bar t plus 1 transpose Pt Ax t minus x bar t plus 1 and I can write Pt equals to This is just some matrix, uh, some bookkeeping that I need to do to make sure everything is correct. All I am doing is collecting the terms together, writing it in a simplified fashion. This PT here is a positive semi-definite matrix that is given by this expression. It can be shown that this is also a non-negative, uh, it's a, sorry, not non-negative but positive semi-definite matrix, P capital T. And, uh, you can further simplify it. You can further simplify it by taking all the terms, collecting all the xt terms together and collecting all the terms that doesn't involve xt uh, separately. So there are many ways by which you can simplify this expression, but you know, I've simplified it in one specific way, which is easier to understand because of the way we have organized the whole expression. But that allows us to solve the optimization problem at the terminal time step. At not the terminal, but one step before the terminal time step. So I have the gamma star t, which is the optimal policy, how I'm going to act. This is my u star t as a function of xt. And then I have the value function. And then all I have to do is replace the value function right here at time t minus 1. I'll have to replace this expression with the expression in the value function at time t change all the indices with t minus 1 and then solve the whole problem all over again but the expressions are going to be the same because the entire problem statement is written in that particular format. So I'm not going to do the derivation for t minus 1, t minus 2 all the way up to time t equals to 1 because you have to follow exactly the same steps, same sequence of steps to get vt minus 1, gamma star t minus 1 and so on and so forth. And what you will realize is that all of this expression, what you have to do is only these matrices are going to change. So wherever you see QT plus 1, these matrices will change and this expression will change. And in this case, these matrices, this matrix is going to change uh, at every point of time. So all you have to do is keep track of these matrices. You can keep getting a recursive expression for this matrix. And wherever you see QT plus 1, Wherever you see QT plus 1, you will have to replace that with PT, okay, in all of these locations. And that gives you the dynamic programming expression for a linear quadratic regulator problem, okay. The reason why this particular algorithm is so famous is because almost all embedded systems, whether it's robotics, whether it's, uh, whether it's space flight mechanics, whether it's... Uh, whether it's an airplane flying from one place to another, whether it's a drone flying, almost all of them use some form of linear quadratic regulator for the tracking purposes, right? So you can track a trajectory. So if you're flying a drone, you want to track a trajectory. If you're flying a plane, you want to track a trajectory, a specific uh, geodesic on the surface of the Earth, surface of planet. If you're flying from here to Mars, you want to fo follow some path 
which takes you to the moon and which takes you to the Venus and then it takes you to Mars. So you want to follow that path. So in almost all of these cases, what you are essentially solving is a tracking problem. And uh, basically some form of this derivation is required in order to do the tracking. The only thing we are not doing here is imposing constraints on UT. Right? So remember this UT that I've mentioned here, it belongs to RM. So if you have constraints on your rocket, if you have constraints on your engine, if you have constraints on your drone, if you have constraints on the uh, vents of this uh, building, in all of those cases, if you have constraints, then you can't really apply this whole situation uh, because the value of UT star could be unbounded. So this side could be very, very large. However, uh, many a times what happens is that you have sufficient uh, amount of effort available uh, because you have always over provisioned. Things are generally highly over provisioned in these critical autonomous systems. So I don't know how many of you know, but you know most of the commercial flights can actually run on one engine. So you have two engines purely for safety, but flights can completely land on one engine. Okay, so so you have always you always have uh, some factor of safety as a result of which you can solve the problem in this way. And if uh, this, this solution turns out to be within the bounds of your action set, then you are completely fine. If it happens to go out of the bounds uh, of your action set, then you have to, of course, uh, solve the constraint optimization problem, which is, of course, uh, order of magnitude more difficult from a computational viewpoint, because then you have to write the fmincon solver for every state and action, for every state at every point of time. So that's a bit complicated. <coughs> Any questions on this? You know, I've recently learned that uh, there are robots who can make fries in McDonald's restaurant. I don't know, there are burger flipping robots in LA now. So you can go to the restaurant, there is no person, you place the order for the burger, it will flip the burger for you, serve you in a tray. So that's possible now. There are people building those robots. If you happen to be in those companies and if you happen to be a robotics engineer in those companies, this will be your bread and butter for the rest of your life. So just so you know. The only difference is we are writing it on the board, you will be coding it in microcontroller. That's the only difference. And coding in microcontroller is order of magnitude harder problem than writing it on the board. So, so it's going to be uh, difficult, challenging to write some of these algorithms in microcontroller. Uh, but uh, that's where many of these algorithms are actually employed. Okay. So I have some time. I'm going to spend uh, like about 10 minutes or so on another problem, which is a resource allocation problem, which is much, much simpler because it's all done in a uh, scalar domain. So if there are no questions, I'm going to erase this side of the board. Okay. So here is my problem. I have uh, xt plus 1 equals to xt minus ut. Uh, here xt is in r, ut is in r. So everything is uh, scalar valued. x0 is given. And my problem is that I want to minimize T equals 1 to capital T uh, minus log of ut plus some constant c times log of xt plus 1. Uh, 
I think there should be a negative side here. Yeah. So this is my problem. I want to solve this problem. And I'll tell you where this problem appears. This is the dynamic resource allocation problem. Here is the situation. I am 65 years old. I have X naught amount of money in my retirement account. Okay? And I need to decide. I'm, I'm expecting that I'm going to live for 35 years. Okay? So my capital T is 35 years. 35. I'm going to live for 35 years after 65, so I'll hit 100. 100 years of age and then I'm just going to drop dead. Uh, that's my plan. Uh, not the real plan, this is the plan in this, in this mathematical problem. So I'm 65 years of age, I need to live till 100, so my T is, capital T is 35. Every year I'm going to take out UT amount of money from my retirement account and pay for my expenses. I'm going to buy food, I'm going to travel, I'm going to pay for medical care, I'm going to rent a house, whatever that may be. So UT is amount of money that I'm going to take out. So next year, I'll only have XT plus one amount in my account, okay, because I've taken out UT amount. What is the value I'm going to get out of this UT amount? So the value is going to be minus log of, so value is log of UT, so the cost is minus log of UT. I'm putting a minus sign here because I want to minimize, uh, I want to do a minimization problem. And at the end of my life, I want to leave out XT plus one amount of money for my kids. That's my goal. And I'm going to have some, some constant C to adjust how much money I want to leave with my kids. Okay, is the problem statement clear? Why is this log of UT? Well, it turns out that uh, log has a very cool property. So log of UT looks something like this. This is ut, this is log of ut. So what is so cool about this, this graph? Well, so initially for every dollar that I consume, I'm going to get a lot of utility, but eventually that utility is going to taper off. If I get, if I spend $30,000 in my retirement every year, I'm going to be happy about it. Uh, if I spend only 10, if I only have $10,000 every year, I'm going to be very, very pressed for money. If I have $30,000, I may be probably okay. If, I'm, if I get $60,000, I'll be very happy. Okay, so that will be somewhere here. And then after that, if I keep getting more and more money, $70,000, $80,000, $100,000, then of course my happiness is not going to increase multifold. Okay, so I'm just going to be you know, instead of having, uh, instead of having a, just bread, I'll eat a burger, okay? So, but I'll still be able to survive, but the happiness is not gonna go significantly higher. So log is able to capture that value very easily. So that's why we have a log there, because the marginal utility of every dollar you consume beyond a certain threshold, it kind of tapers off. So that's what we are trying to model here. This is also true, uh, if you were governor of Texas, you have X naught amount of oil in your, I don't know, oil fields. Maybe not governor of Texas, but you are governor of, not governor, but the president of the company that owns a Texas oil field. So X naught is the amount of oil that is in the field. And every year you have to decide how much oil to extract from the field. So that is UT amount of oil needs to be extracted from the field. This is the amount of money profit you're going to earn. And this is the residual oil that will be left in the well at the end of capital T time steps. Okay, so again, this is a resource extraction problem, but all of those problems are basically studied under this particular uh, mathematical framework. 
So again, we need to solve this problem. So at capital T time, what do I get? I want to solve minimum of ut minus log of ut minus c log of xt minus ut. So without going into uh, too much detail, again, this is a convex problem. This is convex in ut. So I can take the first derivative, set it equal to 0. And that solves my, that gives me the optimal u star t. So let's try to do that. What's the first derivative of minus log of ut? What's the derivative of log? Uh, just minus 1. Yes minus 1 over ut, perfect. And then what about for that one? That gives me this value. And th I'm going to set this equal to 0 for u star t. And I need to solve this problem now ut star minus xt plus c ut star equals to 0, 1 over 1 plus c xt. So this gives me gamma star t of xt equals to 1 over c plus 1 xt. So I get the optimal policy in this particular way. Let's find out what V capital T of XT is. minus log 1 over c plus 1 xt minus c log xt minus ut c over c plus 1 xt. Can I simplify it a bit? I think so. I can take minus 1 plus c log xt minus log 1 over c plus 1 minus c log c over c plus 1. So I get my optimal policy. I get my optimal value. <coughs> OK, so once again in this problem as well, uh, once we formulated the mathematical problem, what the problem is, we applied the principle of dynamic programming. We found out what the optimal policy is as a function of state. And we found out what the value function is as a function of state. This is how you would apply dynamic programming. Again, at t capital T minus 1, you would plug in this particular expression. And you will try to compute what this, uh, what the uh, optimal policy at time t minus 1, t minus 2, t minus 3, and so on is going to be, and what the optimal cost is going to be, optimal value is going to be. So 
That's roughly how you solve dynamic programming. We studied two important dynamic programming problems. One is the tracking problem. The other one is a resource allocation problem or resource extraction problem. You can, you can uh, uh, call it either way. And, uh, and both of these problems are uh, very commonly studied because you can derive everything by hand and you kind of understand exactly what's going on. Uh, at every point of time during the decision making process. So that's all I have for today. We have uh, done, so far we have done controller design using dynamic programming, optimization based controller design. In the next class I'm going to talk about adaptive control, which is a controller design when things are unknown. So right now we have assumed that everything is known. I exactly know what the state expression is, I know what the cost function is and I can solve the problem. In the next class, I'm going to talk about situation where I don't even know what this function looks like. I kind of have some idea about this function, but not, the, not a whole lot. So how do we design our controller in those situations? So that will be subject of study in the next class. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.